I, had, I noticed early on students would come to me and say, um, Dr. Barr, I, I'd like you to help me out as an advisor. I used to be pre-med, but, and then they would fill in the remainder of the sentence with a variety of things. But, but what I have noted and what I have focused a lot of attention on is that there are any number of superb students, many of them women, many of them students of color, who are human biology students who have came into Stanford hoping to go um, as pre-meds to medical school and then become physicians who have dropped that aspiration. And I have worked with them. I'll give you an example of one. One was a young woman, a woman of color, who, who came in and said that to me. And one of the reasons we learned as to why she had lost interest was she had had a very uncomfortable experience in her chemistry courses. She showed me her grades of her freshman chemistry courses, 31, 33, 35. And they were C's and there was an RP and a W and she had just decided that she really wasn't uh, cut out to go to medical school. And I worked with her and she did an honors thesis and she subsequently did a master's program at one of the top public health schools in the country where over a period of two years she earned a 4.07 grade point average, all A's except for three A pluses. Um, and then she reconsidered the issue. Was she really strong enough as a student to go to medical school and of the 14 medical schools she applied to, 14 thought she was because she was admitted to all 14 and she went to one of the top medical schools in the country on a full scholarship. That, when I started hearing this story from other students I couldn't help but ask myself, huh, I wonder what the scientific basis is of equating performance in science courses like chemistry and physics or biology and equating that with quality as a physician and performance in medical school. And in order to find that, being a social scientist, I went through 110 years of literature, which fortunately is now web-based and you can actually get PDFs of JAMA back to the 1890s. Um, I found the funniest thing. There wasn't any scientific evidence in support of using science to select the best students who were going to make the best doctors. And so that led me to writing that finding up, one in the form of a book, that, which combined it with my research on, on the experience of Stanford undergraduates and Berkeley undergraduates in the science classroom. Um, and it also led me to be invited to write a short two-page commentary for the journal The Lancet on why I saw belief that science predicts who's going to be a good doctor, that belief is actually superstitious. It's a superstition. It is not supported by evidence. This is with the caveat, you need to know some science. You need to have a basic knowledge of science. But beyond that basic knowledge, this belief that the more science you learn is a predictor of how good a doctor you will be turns out to be unscientific. And there was this interesting study out of a medical school in Australia that administered the California Personality Inventory, a personality, standardized personality test to students before they started their pre-medical sciences. And then they saw how they did on their pre-medical sciences. And the one, and the strongest association they found was an inverse association between how you did in your sciences and how you scored on the scale of empathy in your entering freshman test, i.e. The higher you scored on empathy entering your pre-medical sciences, the lower your science grades. The higher your science grades, the lower your empathy. So given evidence of an inverse association between one's natural empathetic, uh, uh, natural capacity to empathize and one's ability to do well in science courses, one might suggest that let's do it this way. Let's, see that, let's say that everyone needs a certain threshold of scientific knowledge. You absolutely need that for medical school. Once you have superseded that threshold, then rather than using additional performance in science as the next measure, maybe we should now start looking at your ability to empathize and say, above this threshold of minimum scientific knowledge, the greater your empathy, the better the physician you're going to be. Many Stanford undergraduates will recognize this, the techie fuzzy dichotomy. And I was actually taught about this dichotomy by an undergraduate 
who explained to me that the reason that she used to be pre-med but was because when she was in the chemistry classroom there were far too many techies and she was much more of a fuzzy and she just didn't feel as though she was in place. So I said, let me see if I understand you correctly. Uh, if you had to have, if you, or if your mother had to have brain surgery on an aneurysm and the doctor had to operate exactly right, would you rather have a techie neurosurgeon or a fuzzy neurosurgeon? And she said a techie neurosurgeon because they're going to be better. And I said, I, I'll give you that. And I, I would probably want that the, the, the same way. But let's say instead your mother or someone in your family or yourself had a chronic illness for which there was going to be no cure. Um, but needed to be managed over time with a gradual downhill course. Would you rather have a techie doctor or a fuzzy doctor manage your illness over time? She says, well, I'd much rather have a fuzzy doctor. I said, me too. But if all the fuzzies drop out before medical school, where are the fuzzy doctors going to come from? One of the other things that the AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges, is doing is trying to develop a whole new approach to the selection of students for medical school based on what they refer to as a holistic admissions process. They really want to know more about the whole person. Who is this person who's applying to us? Not just their scores, not just their test scores or their grades. Who is this person? And that is a real challenge of a challenge to educators and a challenge to those in medicine. How do you evaluate the whole person? I've been here for 16 years. If we come back 16 years from now, I think you'll see a human biology that is actually taking a major leadership role in re-examining how we teach science to undergraduates who have an interest in a career focused on issues of health care, health policy, environment, environmental policy. These students are going to be needing to integrate sciences, the natural sciences and the social behavioral sciences, but more importantly, they're going to also need to be able to integrate sciences across disciplinary boundaries. And that's the great thing about human biology. It for decades has been integrating sciences across the boundaries of the natural science and social behavioral sciences into one uh, pedagogy. I think you'll also see human biology breaking down the, division, the, the, the divisions between what is anthropology, what is sociology, what is psychology, what is chemistry, what is biology, and instead the, the science of the human experience will be a much more integrated um, body of knowledge and I think the human biology at Stanford will be in a leading national role in this integrative process.